I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Susan Hart uh, to Webster and to thank her especially for managing to get here uh, despite the Scandinavian Airlines pilot strike. So when I heard the pilots were going on strike, I quickly rang Vlad to see amongst his many other talents if he happened to have a pilot's license in his back pocket <laughs> so as that he could get Susan here. So Susan is a clinical psychologist and family therapist and she has spent many years working in the field of child psychiatry, developing the theory of neuroaffective development. She views child development as taking place in the dynamic interaction between genetic predisposition, neurological development, and the child's environment, leading to a more holistic understanding of early childhood development. Susan teaches neuroaffective theory internationally through lectures, presentations, and workshops, and she has authored and edited many books on this topic. And we're very privileged to have you today, uh, Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for coming here to listen to me today. And um, I, I actually didn't know that Webster had 40-year-old anniversary. And I'd say developing this new effective developmental psychology, that is, I, I'm afraid to say, my 30-year-old <laughs> anniversary. And I really, you know, I, I don't practice my English very much because I live in, in Denmark. So if I lose vocabulary, I hope to have people here around me. Um, I hope I'm amongst friends helping me finding the words if I suddenly uh, lose them, because that happens sometimes in a while. <laughs> but I'm going to, to um, spend the next hour together with you talking about uh, the development of neuroaffective developmental psychology, which actually started these 30 years ago. And um, as um, Kath, she just told you, I am a clinician. I've been a clinician for very, very many years. I finished off my psychology master at Copenhagen University. And it's not more than last November that I managed to defend my PhD. And I had Bruce Perry as one of my opponents. So we had a great um, chat about um, trauma, about how to connect attachment and trauma, and how to, to get more into connecting these different worlds with, with each other. So actually, this has been a journey. It's been a very, very long journey, a map to understand the complex landscape. And um, this development of neuroaffective developmental psychology, it started um, in 89, that was the first time I met Peter Levin. He had a five-day workshop in a summer cottage in the northern part of Denmark. And that was the first time I really imagined how important it was for us to connect biology and psychology with each other. And, you know, that was in just at the beginning where everything about the brain became so very important and to make this connection. And Peter, he was actually the first one to help me to, to make this connection. And I realized the deep, deep connection, which I had never learned at the university, of the connection between brain, brain and personality. So that started in, in the in the beginning of the 1930s, but in the mid-1930s in collaboration with the psychotherapist Marianne Benson, who is a very, very close friend of, of Peter. And um, what I have done is I have developed an ADP as an aid to understanding human personality development. So the, 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 the very, very long journey and the complexity of personality development, what I have aimed to do is trying to integrate developmental psychology, attachment theory, evolutionary psychology, trauma studies, and brain research. So what I, you know, I discovered was that I found all these researchers, either they were into evolutionary psychology or into trauma or into attachment, but bridging the whole thing, I thought that we were lacking something. So that was actually what I wanted to do. And in 2006, 
I, um, I had written, I had authored my two first books, which has been translated into English, but since 2006, I have had, whoops, 14 publications in Danish, unfortunately, but they're all described here, and four of these um, 14 publications has been translated into, into English, and um, I've got this through the windows of opportunity where Peter live in. He is a part of this book. Um, this is translated into German too. And then uh, together um, with a lot of authors, we've got this inclusion play and empathy. And I was so privileged to have Jak Pankset and Colin Trevatan writing the first chapter of this book. And Pat Ogden, she's, uh, she's uh, written a chapter in this book too. So it's been you know, so great to have all these people collaborating together with me because otherwise there wouldn't have been anything called neuroaffective developmental psychology today. So um, in the development of uh, neuroaffective development psychology, you know, it really started when I was working 10 years as a director at a family treatment center. And um, we were very systemic in, in those days, working reflective, um, reflective questions and circular questions and reflective teams. And what I discovered was that we had these families and some of these families just couldn't profit from very narrative-based methods. So what I discovered was, you know, like uh, all methods work for somebody, not all methods work for everybody. So actually I thought the creativity for us as clinicians, that is finding out, what, as Peter Fornagy, he says today, what works for whom. So really, you know, NADP is a theory, a landscape to find out what works for whom. So um, the whole development actually started, you know, in the mid-1990s where Daniel Stern, he was a great, great name. And um, for me, connecting trauma, understanding, biology and brain research together with the fabulous work of Dan Stern, Ektronik, Colvin Trevatan, and trying to bridge these theories where it starts right from the beginning of, of life. But before I'm, I'm, you know, really heading into what neuroaffective developmental um, psychology, what it really is, I've got a small activity for you. And this small activity, in a way, in, in my opinion, it says everything about neuroaffective developmental psychology. It says everything about what's so important amongst us as human beings. So what I would like you to do is to find two people in this room people that you don't really know, and I want you to um, give them a handshake. But, you know, I, I, I suppose you've made handshakes for many, many years, and um, in the country I come from, from Denmark, there is, you know, the, 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 the difficult thing really is when do you give a handshake and when do you give a hug? How do you find out? <laughs> when do you know what to do? And I... I Yesterday, I, w I went into the city of Geneva, and I thought, thought to myself, well, this is a different way of making a handshake. You give one kiss and the one sign and one or the other. And I don't really know how you know how many times you go back and forth. So there's so many cultural things in, in, in this. But now I would like you to give two people in this room that you don't know very well a handshake. But I want you to do something else at the same time. I want you, afterwards we have to discover, discover what is a perfect handshake. How, how, how can we actually describe the perfect handshake? You know, what all the multitasking that we do when we make a handshake. So please find two people that you don't know very well give them a handshake, and find out what you liked about the handshake you received. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes, have you given your two handshakes? If you have, please sit down. It's so very difficult not to fall into talk. Please don't fall too much into talk. Oh, it's very difficult to, to finish the handshakes. So um, what we have to do now is um, to discover, to discover what is, what is a perfect handshake. So what did you notice by the handshake that you received from the other person and what did you do? So there was something about looking at, at one person. Yes, so there was so much body language in the handshake and what you noticed was um, that you looked at each other and, and actually there is a balance in looking at each other because it's very horrible to say hello to somebody and you know they just turn the face away doing like that but it's very horrible too if you know they start to stare <laughs> and you know keep keep the side like that for a long long time that's very stressful would you agree mm -hmm. yeah yes so what else did you discover? Yes? It's all in the pressure. The, the very subtle difference between not enough and too much. Yes. It's a totally different Exactly. That, you know, just yeah. small imbalances or balances. Either the handshake is too soft, you know, it's, you, you don't really feel the hand, and probably you only get the, the fingertips, you don't get the whole hand, and, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's too fierce, so it really hurts a bit, and um, there is something about the length of the handshake, you know, how, how, how do we know how long time to keep the handshake, you know, how it can be too short, but sometimes it's too long. And, and how do you decide the length of a handshake? How do we know? Yes? I just, it seems like the amount of eye contact matches the length of the handshake. It does. There's something about um, the rhythm in the eye contact together with, with the handshake. And, and also there is a lot of rhythm in a handshake. When do we do like this? You know? Hello? Hello? And, and when do we give a very soft handshake? So, so, I mean, there's so much music, so much creativity in a handshake. And there's something about, you know, how close, how distant. And, and, and as you said, there's so much culture in this, and, and how do we know? I mean, we don't, we don't think about it cognitively every time we meet another person, how to make this handshake. I mean, we couldn't keep all these, all these attunements in our cognitive mind. So there's so much intuition in, in, in giving a handshake, and we don't really think about it. But is it inborn? I doubt it. So according to Dan Stern, within the first six months of life, we have learned so much about the attunement amongst us that we do something intuitively, and we do it so intuitively that we don't even think that anybody, it would be a problem for anybody. But what I have discovered in, in, in my pract practical life, my life as a clinician, is that sometimes this rhythm it doesn't establish and there's some people that have the life force has never been you know brought into them in a way that they're able to make this type of connection and i just give you small samples of different types of handshakes and i just want to you to notice what happens when you see these different types of handshakes and how much this first impression gives you of another of another person.
Thank you to Mike Pence. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> in these handshakes. So, so what, you know, I thought is very, very important to, to bridge, but also to see that there is di different developed lines, that is the three domains of development, three domains of important development of our brain. First of all, we've got the cognitive development down here. And cognitive development, we live in societies that's very interested, that's very keen, as much research into cognitive development. So um, the competition these years amongst countries, that's very much education. So, so much time is being invested in research of cognitive development. If you go into, um, into trauma research, but also if you go into to kindergartens, there is very much focus on sensory <coughs> development too, on the body, uh, on motor development, and I suppose so much has been done in our societies to keep us healthy, um, eat the, the right food, nutrition, um, making exercise, to, to keep the body fit for fight. So there is a lot of research too into um, motor development, and everybody knows too that sensory motor development is quite important. But what I do think there is a lack of, that is not talking about emotion, not talking about feelings, we, we do a lot of that, but to see emotional development as a very, very important line of development, like cognitive development, like sensory de um, development, and the three domains of development needs stimulation. So if the brain doesn't get the right stimulation to, um, to, develop, um, to develop and mature, you'd see disruptions and you see um, dysregulations in, in the personality development. And what I discovered and what my PhD degree was about was to see is it possible to find um, levels of emotional development. And what I discovered when I worked in a child psychiatry ward where I made a lot of psychological assessments of children was that we've got so many assessment methods measuring cognitive development. Uh, now, as a psychologist, we don't use very many assessment methods of sensory motor development. But what I discovered was that when we wanted to know something about uh, the children's, the youth, the adults' personality development, Either we use projected tests, Rorschach, CAT, TAT, which were developed back in the 1920s, or American questionnaires. Any species where we could say that nature is our culture and culture is our nature. So, so much is put into the nervous system through the connection together with other people, through the attachment, through the attunements, the misattunements, and the repair of attunements. So Hebb's axiom, neurons that fire together, wire together, I think is a beautiful way of explaining how our billions of neurons are connected in the brain. He's very known for his theories about dissociation. But I found this sentence where he, he told us about how to build up resilience, which is not about trauma, which is necessary to build in resilience, which helps us go through trauma when uh, very, very big macro ruptures actually when, when they happen. Experiences, of course, can be so overwhelming or you can be so fragile that you need psychotherapeutic help to, to get, get through a trauma or to get through a, an overwhelming experience. 
So it's our feelings that make connections between us, and actually this is the foundation of attachment. So really what we need to do is to find out um, attachment, what is attachment? I mean, John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, they were the two persons talking about attachment in the beginning, but I do believe that um, what the work of, of Stern, Tronic, Travartan, they, they actually tell us the choreography that happens that creates the attachment pattern and, um, and also the way we act when we need um, to, to reconnect after a rupture. So the ability for attachment is genetically based, but is formed through our culture and history. So that means deep, deep down in our evolutionary history, we are social mammals and we need the connection between us. And that's what creates um, a secure base. That's what creates a, a secure haven. So actually, it's, it's the attachment between us that, that creates safety. So in all the psychotherapeutic methods I know that, that goes into emotional development, personality development, has very, very much to do with the connections. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's the non-specific factors in, in psychotherapy, which um, this book, Through Windows of Opportunity, was actually made out of a two-day conference we made together with Peter Levin and with a German psychologists living in London, working together with Peter Fornagy and two other very prominent, prominent psychotherapists, actually to find the non-specific moments in psychotherapy. Because sometimes, actually, we think that it's something that we do that helps because it's a part of the method. But very often, we don't look at the non-specific factors. So in my opinion, it's so just so important. Everything you did in the handshake before, that, that comes much more into our consciousness. So actually, we, we get involved in how we do connect with, with other people. So um, John Bowlby, he was the first one to say that although attachment behavior is particularly evident in early childhood, it is considered a human characteristic throughout life from cradle to grave. That's a part of being a human being. And I mean, we know from, from trauma work how important it is to, that the people that we are trying to help with the traumas, that they feel connected to other people. It's just so very, very important. And now, as you see, I didn't get this translated completely, and I just discovered this this morning. So it's about the secure base, and it's about, um, if you, somebody of you are familiar with um, the, 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 the parent program, uh, Circle of Security, so this is actually um, the secure base, and it's a way, to, when you have a secure base, that you're able to be curious. And you go out in the world, to find out all of these beautiful things because you've got a safe haven that's connected inside of you. So what Mary Ainsworth and Bowlby, they were so, um, so much into, that was what it means to have a secure base, but also inside of yourself having a secure haven that you, that you become curious from. And what we actually know from many of the clients and many of the family treatments that I have been into, when you find people they are insecure, it's much more difficult for them to find their creativity, it's much more difficult for them to be curious about their lives. So nearly all psychotherapeutic methods start off with finding a secure base. In one way or the other, that's one of the basic things in nearly all psychotherapeutic methods. I'm just going to show you a little video again, just showing you uh, this um, circle of security and how important it is even for small children, not even having a language, not even being able to draw yet, how they are connected to the attachment person, but how they need to go out and be curious in the world, but needs emotional refueling by seeking back to the attachment figure. And you know what Bowlby actually says, because when I have been uh, in connection with adult psychiatry, I have been amazed how little knowledge there is about that all human beings 
they've all had a childhood. Everybody's been a child once in a while. And very often in, in adult psychiatry, that's forgotten. You know, it, it's like it starts off, the, the problem starts when, when they become adults. But if you look back in the life story, you'd often see that the dysregulation or the lack of self-regulation, it starts much earlier and very often back in the childhood. But I like, you know, to look at the resource side. And what you see here is the resource of the child making this um, circle of security. But the newfound freedom of crawling and all that goes with it comes at an emotional price. It's a time of great anxiety for the baby human. Max has come shopping with his mother. He looks around to see what potential the space has for crawling. It's full of new and fascinating things. Although Max approves of his mother's choice in shoes, in a minute, there will be more interesting things to do. He just has to wait for the right opportunity. While his mother's busy, Max takes off. It's hard to stop a crawler. Crawling babies cover a distance of three football fields a day. And they like to practice crawling every minute they can. Max loves his newfound independence. But at this age, the further he crawls from his mother, the more anxious he becomes and needs to be reassured. Like a comet circling the sun, he goes away and zooms back over and over again. Psychologists call this emotional refueling, and it's something Max will need to do more often as he faces the next major... And actually, I mean, we, we know this from, from adult life. Uh, you know, yesterday, Kath, you said to me, well, sometimes it's nice going back to Ireland. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's nice getting back to your homeland. It's nice getting back to the secure base where it all started. But you, the journey's there much longer. <laughs> you don't have to, to circle back the same way as, as this two-year-old. So, I mean, it's something that happens even in our adult life. And as Dan Stern, he said years and years ago, we as human beings, we are all born to participate in each other's nervous system. So, I mean, that's, in my point of view, that, that's what the emotional stim stimulation in the brain is about. That is how it's stimulated through neurons that fire together, that wire together, which is very, very different from cognitive learning of language and mathematics. That's a different type of stimulation. But emotions, that's the glue between us. And the glue between us needs that type of stimulation that's so internalized that you were able to make the handshake um, a quarter of an hour ago and you were able to connect with the other person so much that it was so difficult for me to make you finish again, <laughs> to make you sit down again. So, so, I mean, we are so trained in this form of a choreography and um, that's the way we participate in each other's nervous system. That's how we develop. That's the foundation of personality development, of emotional development, of social development. So um, what Tronic, he said, is that self-regulation of temper, mood, and emotions is learned through the co-regulation of interactions. So it's actually the co-regulations that train this. And this starts from the very beginning of life. Now, I'm going to show you a little video clip once again. But this mother is together with a very, very young infant. And I want you to, to, to see if it's possible for you to see how we don't do, of course, the same thing with an adult in psychotherapy, but there's a lot of this self-regulation that this mother, she does, that in a way, in a different way of doing it, of course, but it's exactly the same way we create self-regulation together with an adult that's very, very stressed, that's very, very traumatized, that's where, where the pulse is sky high, because what you're going to see here is um, an, an infant that starts off in a very, very displeasure, sky high, stressful mode. And I want you to notice what this mother does 
to try to calm the child down into something that's nice and relaxing, how she creates a molding response in, in, in this very young infant. Voluntary signal of distress. The baby human can't really make any other sounds yet because they have small mouths, large tongues, and at this age their larynx is high in the throat to prevent choking. But even though Heather's cries are involuntary, her mother responds. It's Heather's first way of knowing that the sounds she is making are a way of communicating. And that when she does, there is someone listening. When Heather hears her mother's voice, it immediately sees her. that from the first days of life, babies prefer the human voice over every other sound. But what is surprising is just how attuned to language they are. So, I mean, as you probably noticed, it's not what the mother is talking about that makes a difference. It's her way of using all the perceptions, um, the auditory, the visual, the tactile, the way that she communicates with her soft voice, the way she uses her voice, all these perceptions, that's what is caught by the child, and um, that's what calms down the child, and that's really the basic part of learning self-regulation. So what you actually see here is what we do with clients too. We use our voice, we use our tonality, we use um, uh, a way of looking at the client, the way of closeness, of uh, active listening to the client. We try to calm their arousal down. So there's so many aspects we intuitively we do with, 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 with other people, even though they're adults, which is very, very similar to what this mother, she actually does. So again, we, we're picking up on the non-specific factors. And um, the complexity of this intersubjectivity is so much, in my opinion, you've got the, the child, and the child, of course, has some inborn capacity. Um, and you, as you know, I suppose you know too, that uh, at infants, they can be very, very different from the very beginning of life. Some people, you have to down-regulate them very, very much because they become stressful. And other infants, they sleep very much, so you really have to arouse them to keep them awake. So, so actually, it's the intersubjectivity, it's the interaction that's just so important. But of course, also the parent's capacity to, to, to nurture the child and to give them the, the stimulation that they need and, and in my opinion, the dreadful part is that a parent can't give more than they actually have, than they've had from their own childhood. So very often we see these transgenerational disruptions because you can't give more of a parent than, than you've actually got. You can't give people any money if you haven't got them. And that's like psychological-wise, you can't give children what you don't have yourself. But unfortunately, the child can't pick up on development uh, from, from what the, the surroundings, the people around them, they haven't got. So actually, we see the, uh, sometimes we see the, the transactional problem of a disorganized attachment pattern, which is, in my opinion, very, very sad. So um, to me, what we really have to do is also to look as ourselves, as clinicians, as therapists, because in my opinion, we've got something that's very important here in what I've called the neuroaffective triangle. 
And then the new affective triangle, that is that we have to have a global theory of emotional development based on integration of relevant theory, integrating, bridging so much knowledge that has been researched for, for years and years now, for decades. And from that, we have to develop assessment methods and intervention method, methods to find out um, what works for whom. We need the assessment methods, but also uh, I discovered that, that in the US, there is about 2,500 registered different psychotherapeutic methods. So there's just so many different methods to choose from. And in my opinion, we, we actually don't really need more methods, but we need to know what works for whom. And then again, we know that the self-agency, the clinical skills of intersubjectivity and counter-transference counter from the psychotherapist means just so much because you have to be able, together with your client, to create this secure base. You have to be trustworthy and you have to be a person that, that the client uh, has a trust into. So you can have the best theory in the world, you can have a wonderful, wonderful uh, intervention method, but if you haven't got your own person, your self-agency to follow that, you, you won't make any development, you can't help your client. So the important thing is understanding of why the client does as he or she does, which way to go and what to do, and then my influence on the interaction between us. The counter-transference. And what is the crown jewel of uh, human personality? Well, in, in my opinion, it is the capacity of mentalization, as Peter Fornegy, he brought forward some time ago. And what is mentalizing? Well, mentalizing is actually a very, very complex concept because mentalization and reflection, that's two different things. So what's the difference? Well, to mentalize is to connect the brain and the heart. And I've been together with Peter Fornegy several times, and I've taken two sentences out of everything he says, because he says very, very, very beautiful things, but just, you know, just to try to see if it's possible to pin down what mentalization, what it really is. In Peter Fornegy's opinion, it is not only a matter of thinking clearly, but also a matter of feeling clearly. So thinking clearly, that's a cognitive part, that's just the reflection part. That is that, we've, we, that we, we make a lot of reflections about our clients, about methods, of, about how to deal with different things, but what is feeling clearly? Well, mentalizing, the feeling clear, clearly part, is about seeing or being able to see yourself from the outside and others from the inside. So that's really getting the body. So that is really being able to actually feel, what am I feeling inside of myself right now? What, what are my sensations? What are my feelings? And how do I grasp the other person standing in front of me? Where are they? How do they look? How are they smiling? Are they looking sad? How do they look in the face? So really, mentalization is about um, getting the body and the brain together, getting the body and the cognitive world, bringing those two worlds together and being uh, conscious about what's happening inside of yourself and having a feeling of what's happening inside the other person without being completely sure. So, so mentalizing dialogues is actually, in my opinion, what creates creativity of symbolization because words are actually a symbolized words and before in before children toddlers they're able to put something into words they put it in to play but what we know is that play has different emotional stages as well because it starts off with um, games um, creating achievement and then it continues with um, games that's about effective achievement, sharing emotions together. And not before we hit into the prefrontal stage, we find children go into play with symbols. 
So I just want to give you a short video here about how mentalizing dialogues, how they are created in development. Here we have a little young boy, I suppose he's about between two and three years of old, of age, and he's just, you know, he's, he's just been able to speak English and um, just li listen to the dialogue between the mother and this boy. when that comes through, that is a way of starting dialogues where the, 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 the cognitive world and the emotional world, they are put together. Now, let's see what just happened. Oh, that was the wrong one. Yes, <laughs> so what Daniel Schachter, he said years ago, was that new circuits consist of many parallel interaction systems, which gives a potential danger of dissociation. So what I've shown you actually now that is how no neural circuits, how they associate. But when we're overwhelmed, when we, are, uh, when we experience trauma, uh, all these connections that has been associated, they are in danger of being dissociated. So anatomically, dissociation can occur in any part of the nervous system that consists of association neurons or polymodal circuits where subsystems that normally communicate begin to restrict and delimit their functions. And actually, that was the theory of Pierre Genet, what he wrote about so very, very many years ago. And I just want to show you different types of misattunements, just to show you in the attachment how these disruptures happen. And some of these disruptures are actually a bit more serious than other disruptors. So I'm going to show you three small clips, and they're not very, very nice, any of them. Um, but, you know, they're not all that serious. But what I really do think that we have to divide between that is very, very overwhelming traumatic experience that only happens very, very seldom, and not by um, the people that you're attached to. And when it's a daily doses of misattunement. So what I really do think is that we have what develops personality, and then we have what happens when you are so overwhelmed by um, very, you know, once in a time experiences. So what I'm going to show you here is a first clip taken from the, the, uh, the YouTube about a child. And, and this video was put into the YouTube with uh, the heading, um, the, the um, uh, temper tantrum, temper tantrum. So I don't think that these parents that put this clip into YouTube, they imagined or they realized they, you know, they wanted to focus on the child, but they didn't notice the three fingers. When you point at somebody, you've got all the other fingers pointing towards yourself. So what I, yeah, I mean, I don't know the parents, but what I do believe by seeing this clip is that their mentalization capacity is not all that 
developed because otherwise I don't think they would put this video into the YouTube. laughing at the toddler while she was in, in a state where she couldn't self-regulate. How terribly that is. And I mean, if you have experienced a lot of these disruptions and you later on in life experience a trauma, there is no resilience here. So, so I mean, the way of learning self-regulation is having somebody else to help you. So, I mean, it's, it's also so it's so important to see what, what creates um, what creates resilience. And I'm just going to show you a, another very, it's very, very short, but, you know, in a way, I think that what this father, he actually does is that he's giving this child a trauma from one single instance um, with the child at this very young age. person, uh, the caregiver, to, to be attuned to the child and, and, and see see what, what, what happens because it's it's so easy to make these misattunements. And as Ectronic he said that um, if you only if you only create misattunements you don't you don't create any um, self regulation capacity which is the basis of resilience. But of course you have to have the ruptures because if you don't get the ruptures you don't develop. So it's, it's actually repairing the misattunements that's just so very, very important. And I mean, I'm just going to show you the last video here where you see this is a misattunement, but in a completely different way because this is much more into, into um, the handshake business. Some infants love more stimulation. Some less. It all depends on their temperament. When things get to be too much, babies have some tools of their own. When Maya's father gets too close, Maya looks away. That's her way of communicating to her father that she feels overstimulated. How close, how far, the amount of touching and stimulation are regulated by the emotional reactions of the baby human. And one hopes they have parents who are a good match temperament-wise, or are sensitive enough to pick up on their baby's cues. Sometimes an overzealous dad needs to be educated. Too much of a good thing can be stressful, and Maya lets her dad know just how she feels. 
So again, you know, there is um, the emotional development, but what I also do think that is that we've got all these 2,400 different wonderful psychotherapeutic methods. So what we really have to do is also to um, divide them into what 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 we really want to um, what we want to create through 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 the method. So psychological imbalances may be caused by regressive processes due to strain and psychological overload. And I think, you know, we all know how it is to be overloaded. I think that's a part of life. That's a part of living in our society. That happens sometime. And what Peter Fornicke, he says with a big smile, that is that that's a time where we all lose our mentalization capacity. It happens for everybody. So that's a part, a part of regress, re, re, regression, and, and, and the thing in the psychotherapeutic stance here is to create a secure base, to, to create a grounding, to, to, to create a way of being in the world, being grounded, to get out of the, the, the regression. Then we've got um, dissociation as something that happens uh, in the brain, and then we've got lack of development in neural structures and circuits. And all this needs different type of, of psychotherapeutic methods. So, so let's just have a look. We've got treatment goals for psychological imbalances, and some of them is about symptom reduction. Some methods are about emotional and personality development. And I'm so thrilled to, um, to see that there is a workshop here afterwards about play because I really do think that we have to have see the importance in play. As Yang Pang said, he says, all mammals, not mice, but rats, they play clearly. And the more intelligent uh, a mammal is, the more time we use for play. So, you know, I think there is a very, very big, um, um, there, there is something in play that we have to be more aware of in emotional development and Grown-ups, they play a lot too. Olympic Games, that's a way of playing. Mm -hmm. So we've got um, all these um, treatment methods that's about emotion, uh, emotional and personality development. And then we've got our trauma healing um, methods, which is about integration of dissociated structures. And um, I do think that the concept from Vygotsky here is very, very important. Um, the zone of proximal development because in my point of view it's so important in our psychotherapeutic method to find the right the, the right strategy for the right person and you know if they've caught a trauma it's also very very it's very important to know what personality what what was the personality before they, they caught the trauma so because that's very important for what method to use and I in my experience have seen adults where um, where methods that that relies on narratives, uh, it just didn't work because these people they had narrative, they had a language, but they couldn't connect the narratives with their emotions. And in those circumstances, it's very it's very important for us to find what methods. And actually, there's only about five six percent of the existing methods that relies that that um, s s s uh, psychological imbalances, uh, mental balances, they are, they are regulated through methods uh, in language before language. So we really do, don't have a lot of methods working on this very, very basic level. And what, because what Lindvigarsky also says is that development proceeds from outer regulation to inner regulation, something that was implicitly shared between two people as an interpersonal event becomes an inner intrapersonal psychic ability. And that's what we really are seeking for in child development, but that's also what we see in our, in our um, psychological treatment, in our psychotherapies. So um, it's about what I call establishing macro and micro regulation. But I can see my time is running, so um, I'm going to just um, um, continue a little bit here to my finishing off minutes, because um, one thing that Edtronic was very much into is that we know when you as an adult experience a lack of resonant reaction from other people, such as a mirroring contact, 
your psyche is affected and your immune defense is weakened. And I mean, all the, the things you said when we made the handshake, that really tells us how important it is to be connected with another person and how much, how much damage it creates that it can, go, that it can, um, it can affect our immune system, that it's weakened. So, so it's just so important with the connection. And um, Ed Trotter, he had um, he had this lovely video, and I probably you know, it, probably you don't know it, but I think it's a very very important video just to show you. He made this still face experiment. How important uh, it is to give this resonant contact, and even a one year old child, and the one year old child you're going to see now, um, the mother was. The researcher at his laboratory. So he said to her, "Well, you have you have made this this experiment on so many infants, and now it's your turn." <laughs> so it's actually the researcher that makes the still face in front of her one-year-old child, and just have a look to see how quick the infant realizes the rupture, and just notice also how quick when the mother becomes active again, the misattunement is repaired. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. <laughs> in the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I like the girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually they lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. of the misattunement that's so just so important and um, the reparation this what what you saw was um, a, a secure attachment pattern because it was so easy to repair the misattunement so what I'm going to continue to do in my workshop is I'm going to continue to go into the heuristic model of the emotional development the tree triune bay brain with the autonomic nervous system, the arousal regulation and body sensation that happens from zero to three months. After that, the limbic system, affective attunement and categorical emotions from three to 12 months. And what happens when we've got prefrontal cortex, acts of will, impulse control, mentalization, everything that happens in one to 23 years and how we can use this uh, as a model when we make psychotherapy according to what works for whom using these neuroaffective compasses. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.